Uh, we can start on time now. Uh, so good evening, uh, respected members of uh, the Twitter Glo Global Platform and Universities. Uh, welcome to you all to a new international webinar organized by uh, the Twitter uh, Global uh, Platform. I'm uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Ahmar, uh, the director of the Twitter Global uh, Platform, and uh, I will be moderating uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, we will have uh, the registration and certificate link uh, sent to you uh, by the, uh, through the chat box at the end of the webinar so that you can register and have your uh, certificate of attendance. Uh, and also, uh, if you have any technical problems or if you, have, if you have any comment or any note about the uh, webinar or throughout the webinar, uh, please write it in the chat box so that we can uh, uh, read it and have a look on it. And if you have any technical problems, please please write it in the chat box, and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, try uh, try to answer you. Uh, Professor Brown, uh, just uh, uh, a reminder about the recording. Uh, if you could you uh, please start the recording? Yes, thank I've you. done that. Thank you very much. Yeah, because you asked me to remind you. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, welcome our eminent uh, speaker, uh, Professor Mark Brown. Uh, who is the director of the National Institute for the Digital Learning at Dublin City University. Uh, he will talk uh, today about unboxing the future uh, education for new times. Uh, we are very grateful for our invited speaker, Professor Brown, for his uh, valuable time and accepting our invitation. And we are very grateful for uh, sharing his experience and knowledge with us. Uh, let me introduce you to uh, Professor uh, Mark Brown. Uh, he is the director of National Institute for, for Digital Learning, Dublin City University. And Professor Brown is an island first chair in digital learning and director of National Institute for Digital Learning, NIDL. Uh, Professor Brown has uh, over 30 years uh, experience of working uh, uh, in higher education and has played uh, key leadership roles in the development, implementation, and evaluation of several major university-wide digital learning and teaching initiatives. He is also a member of many executive uh, committees, uh, including European Distance and E-Learning Network, EDEN, uh, European Consortium for Innovative Universities, ECIU, and European Association for Distance Teaching Universities, EADTU, and a member of the advisory board for the US-based uh, Online Learning Consortium Research Center for digital leader learning and leadership. Uh, Professor Brown's main uh, research uh, interests are the area of uh, digital learning, blended education, uh, open educational uh, practices, uh, and new online delivery models, including MOOCs, learning design, effective pedagogy, academic development, and uh, higher education. Uh, so very warm welcome uh, to Professor uh, Brown, and we are lucky to have uh, him with us uh, in this uh, age of uh, uh, accelerating digital uh, online learning throughout the world due to the COVID-19 issue. So a very warm welcome to uh, Professor Brown and uh, Professor Brown, uh, please. Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm always embarrassed to hear all of those uh, things that you read out. I'm delighted to be able to be here talking with you uh, late this evening, early evening my time. And hopefully I have put together something that will get you thinking, um, make sure that I challenge you a little bit, but I'm also very respectful that your context is very different to what I'm used to. Um, some things you can learn from perhaps, but there are some things where I think you need local solutions for local problems. I'm very mindful, and here I am just one year ago, almost to the day, not quite, back in November 2019, I'm standing in front of the uh, 800 or so delegates at, from 80, more than 80 countries at the World Conference on Online Learning that we hosted here in Dublin, and I had the privilege to be the conference chair. Who would have imagined that in only a few months due to the COVID-19 outbreak in particular, that online education was going to become so important to our um, ability to keep teaching and almost actually to keep our societies working. 
Um, something that you didn't mention in my introduction that I'm going to add is in the picture here, I'm wearing a green Irish rugby jersey, rugby being a, a popular sport in Ireland. But actually, I'm not originally from Ireland. Um, and my accent is not Irish. I don't expect you to um, understand or pick up my accent. But my accent is from a place which is quite a good place to be right now. I am originally from New Zealand, right at the bottom of the world. And in New Zealand, they no longer have the COVID-19 um, virus because they've managed to control it. So uh, unfortunately, I will be some time before I think I can return to New Zealand to uh, see in person our family and sons and daughters. But um, certainly, as I was saying, COVID-19 has really made online learning in particular now um, incredibly timely and important. But I think we need to understand, and I'm going to interchange with the word online education with digital learning. Online education is not new, nor is digital learning. It's just that it's become so much more topical as so many people are still not being able to study um, on campus. And that is the case in Ireland. Our university students still cannot go back to campus instruction. Um, a couple of things that might be useful for you to know about, um, albeit that they are in English. Um, but one of the first things that I was involved in with some colleagues um, is back in April of this year when our campuses closed, we produced a free online course on how to teach online um, on one of what is known as the MOOC platforms, the one of the free massive open online course platforms. In this case, it was FutureLearn. I think FutureLearn have a handful of Arabic courses, but not many. Um, so far, 90,000 educators around the world have registered to do this course, to complete the course. Um, so if you're not aware of the course and you are English um, uh, able to study, you may wish to take a look at this course and I can follow up with the links. But similarly, one of the things we found here in Ireland is that when we moved to have to go fully online for teaching, our students were not very well equipped to learn online. They actually have generally very good digital skills, but just because you have digital skills does not mean that you know how to be an online learner. So we also, back in September of this year, launched this free online course on what's called a digital edge essentials for the online learner. So far about six and a half thousand people have done this course. And interestingly, the course is facilitated, taught by other students, because part of the message is that sometimes the students know as much as we know. So the next iteration or offering of this free online course on FutureLearn will be in January, if you wish to take a look at that. But you can log into it now and see what's in the course if you want to produce something in Arabic for your own students. So I'm interestingly using this concept of unboxing. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term unboxing, because it's probably a very Western developed a country term, um, but you may well, if you ask your children, perhaps, because they may be familiar with that. If I were to ask you and do a poll, I'm not going to do a poll right now, a live poll, because I thought this might be a little challenging, but if I asked and gave you a poll, you could perhaps select one of these options for what you think unboxing refers to. I actually used this same poll in a presentation about two weeks ago for a group in Malaysia. And so they did have a live poll. And this is what they came back on um, in terms of those options. Most people thought that the term unboxing was about unwrapping a new piece of technology. Actually, unboxing is something that happens on YouTube. And it happens particularly with young children who seem to take great delight in videoing themselves with their smartphones, with their iPhones or other forms of phones as they unbox presents. So these are short videos of people unboxing things. And when you get a present, a gift, 
Um, there's always a thrill when you go to unwrap it because you don't know what's inside it. Um, and this is an interesting, what we would call a metaphor for online learning and digital learning, because you have that thrill when you get a new piece of technology. When you open it up and you look at it, it looks interesting. But in my case, and this might happen for uh, a lot of people, after a while, the new thrill of the present wears off. And sometimes whatever was in the box ends up being put in the cupboard somewhere, put away, and I don't ever use it again. Or alternatively, the word unboxing, um, this is a term that's probably very English, uh, known as Jack in the Box. And you can see the image there. Uh, it's a child's toy that uh, by pressing the box, the Jack comes out of the box. And once something is out of the box, it's hard to put it back in. So right now, online learning is out of the box. When the COVID-19 crisis is over, do you think we will want to put online learning back into the box? Or do we want to really leverage the opportunities that are available? In a country like Iraq, uh, a large country geographically, I can only imagine the potential and the opportunities for education that online forms of uh, delivery provide. So I don't really see us in the future wanting to go back to just the traditional way of doing things. One last part before I really get underway about the box or the idea of unboxing. As you're unboxing something, I always think that the real light comes through the gaps. New knowledge is by looking and finding the gaps. So as we're unboxing, there's some gaps. Can we see what's inside those gaps? So in this short talk, I'm wanting to look at some of the gaps we have with new technology in education. One of the gaps is what I sometimes describe as the rhetoric reality gap. Sometimes we're told new technology can do this, but actually in reality, we only do something else quite mundane with it. Um, alternatively, sometimes we're told that new technology gives us the state of the art. We can be so future focused but if you really look at how most people use new technology in education, it's for quite traditional things that are not state of the art. And then as this slide tries to demonstrate, there's also a near and a far gap when it comes to new technologies in education. It seems that we're always thinking about what the next big thing might be. Is it artificial intelligence and what that's going to do? So we have what we have now, but what's, there's always something coming down the tube. In this case, I'm using an image of the tube train in London. So in the time left, I have three things I want to cover and we'll see if I get through all of those in the time. I'm gonna talk about some of the false promises. I touched on that already. I'm gonna talk about why design the question of design and being really intentional is important. So I'll be a little theoretical um, there. And then the last section, very short, I'm gonna be talking about how you break out of the box. And that's probably where your um, questions and your feedback will be really important because breaking out of the box has a different meaning depending upon where you are in your particular context. So that's what I want to cover, but I have two last things to give uh, to share with you before I get started more fully on the substance. Firstly, it's often said, Nelson Mandela actually is quoted as saying that education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. And I'm, again, very respectful of your region and your experience in that context. Um, I don't really like the idea of weapon here, but I think in this um, quote, it takes that idea one step further. Education by itself does not change the world. Education changes people. And it's the people who change the world. So it doesn't really matter how little or how much technology you have, because if you don't have the people who are willing to change and transform, then I don't think technology will do that for you. The second thing I wanted to share with you, for those of you, um, that want to explore 
a suite of resources, a database of resources for online teaching. This is a website that we maintain. And so there are lots and lots of things you can find on this um, website, videos of recorded other webinars and lots of rich resources. So I'm just giving you an alert to that. Okay, without any further ado, normally I would stop probably now and take some questions, but I will just keep going on. False promises. Winston Churchill, the um, famous British Prime Minister during the First, Second World War, once said, the farther backward you look, the farther forward you can see. <laughs> Excuse me. And I'm sure there's an Arabic proverb of some uh, manner that captures this again, that sometimes the future exists in the past and we need to have some wisdom here. So let me share with you um, a quote that some people might think comes from 1994, when the World Wide Web was first really invented, this amazing automatic library at your fingertips. You may not have experienced that in 1994, but um, that's one of the things of the internet that has been truly transformative. Um, well, actually this quote, uh, and I won't read it for you, isn't 1994, it actually comes from 1894. And the quote refers to the invention of the wax phonograph cylinder. I don't think there's anyone too old here that can remember this old enough. Uh, I'm certainly not uh, that old. Um, so the wax phonograph cylinder was seen as an educational tool that was going to transform the way we do things. And actually there's a long history in uh, certainly the United States, of how technology will somehow radically transform education. So this is a quote that comes referring to the way in which the invention of the movie, the motion picture, was going to somehow transplant and make the textbook, the traditional textbook, redundant. Well, it's a dirty little secret, to be honest, if I'm not offending anyone by saying textbooks in most parts of the world are still very common tools that we use in learning resources. So the motion picture did not replace the textbook. Similarly, in 1935, when television was first invented, a lot of people don't realize that television was available even before the Second World War. It's just that the war interrupted its implementation in, in more developed countries. So when television was first invented, it was seen as if it was going to be able to present just what I'm doing right now, lectures into your households. It took a very long time for that to happen. And most definitely educational television did not transform the traditional way of teaching and learning. So there are these claims and I'm going to hopefully if um, my video plays, show you a very old video. It comes from a very famous project in the 1960s in the United States called Project Plato. Where this was the very first large scale effort to bring education to people through computers. So let's see, and uh, I'll hopefully cross my fingers that this video comes through for you. and the most ambitious assault on this problem has come from Project Plato in the state of Illinois, where a big computer has been hooked up to over a thousand terminals and where literally tens of thousands of students have been and are being routinely taught by a computer. Now, the range of teaching programs available is enormous. Every student, of course, has personal tuition and some remarkable results have been achieved. is the heart, or I suppose you should say the brains of the Plato system. By world standard, it's not a particularly big computer, but it knows the names of thousands of students and how well or how badly they're doing at any particular moment. It's also got in its memory over 15,000 teaching programs, ranging from rudimentary spelling right up to advanced clinical medicine. Most stunning of all, perhaps, is the fact that it goes about its business 24 hours a day without a single human being supervising it. It's totally dedicated, endlessly patient, and supremely tolerant. 
a teaching computer which is a staggering foretaste of the future of world education. So that was 1960s that people were seeing that somehow computers would be able to re almost replace teachers. How wrong they got it in that prediction at the end of the video that this would be the future of education. Having said that, artificial intelligence is having people make exactly the same predictions right now. In some respects, what you saw in that video where you had people learning in little cubicles is not dissimilar to this image here of pigeons and having to be taught by a machine and an individual learner being isolated from other learners. Some people still see that as the future of education. I don't because one thing we know about learning is learning is a very social process. And so we want the people to engage and talk because learning is about conversation, not just the delivery of content into my head. I'll mention this shortly again. Having said that, um, as I said, new technologies do open up new possibilities. And this is an image that comes from China where yes, teaching robots are being introduced. But the thinking behind this is very similar to the thinking of the 1960s. And it's not the kind of education that many of us want to see for the future. So coming to the end of this first section, the use of new technology in education has had a long history of what we could describe as chasing a rainbow, chasing a technological rainbow, that somehow new technology is going to transform what we do, and all we need to do is get to that pot of gold or the new technology at the base of the rainbow. Actually, what we know from the history of new technology in education is typically it goes through this cycle of hype, hope, and then sadly, disappointment. Now, I don't want to be too negative or critical because actually many of those disappointments turn out to be learnings that we build into the next wave of new technology. So sometimes failure is not a bad thing. But what I'm alerting you to is that there are many people trying to sell us new technologies as solutions we just need to think more carefully about what the problem is that we want the technology to solve. So my first lesson, and I'm going to have three lessons in the presentation. My first lesson for you is you just can't unbox something and expect that because this latest new shiny thing comes out of the box that it's going to transform teaching just because it looks good. Actually, it's most unlikely to do that. As I said, it will be the people that make a difference. Now, normally I would stop here and take some questions, but um, it just isn't uh, quite the same forum for the microphones not available to you. So I'll keep going and we'll do the questions at the end. So this is the second part, a question of design. In order to take that technology out of the box, and really get it to work and do what we want, then this raises a question of what I'll call learning design. Learning design is about trying to make really explicit and purposeful decisions about what we want our learners to do, to know, and to experience. And even to go one step further. So this is about being very deliberative and intentional. One step further in choosing new technologies in education is not all learners are the same. We have adult students, we have young children, we have people with technology skills, we have people with no or minimal technology skills. So you have to ask these questions first before you choose the appropriate approach. Who are your learners? What do you want them to learn? Or what are their learning intentions? And then Having answered those questions, what's the best design? What's the best course design for your students and your learning outcomes? For many of you with an educational background, this is probably very common sense in what you know. But in your particular context, 
the next question about designing your course, um, I won't have any really idea about what tools you already have available, what might not be available. So that's going to also constrain uh, or maybe enable different kinds of design. So it's important that you understand what's available to you. And this is not just done by accident. It may be that many of you make use of Moodle as a learning management system or a virtual learning environment because it's freely available, relatively speaking. What I do want to say, though, is that these new tools we have, and I'm going to refer to the here, a concept of digital leakage. Historically, university education in particular, or even in schools, we have focused on our education, I'm going to say on campus or on site, in class, inside the traditional classroom. Now, we have to think about other spaces and places for learning. So we have these three other places um, that fill this quadrant of four spaces. We have to think about just as importantly, on campus, out of class learning. What learners learn informally over their lunch and over their tea breaks um, or coffee breaks is just as important. And we need to design for that, not leave it to chance. But equally, on the other side of the screen, off campus in class and off campus out of class, these are all important spaces for learning. So for learning design, not just the yellow on campus in class, we need to be thinking intentionally about how we can build seamlessness across all four of those domains or quadrants. And new technologies help us leak across those. I could be more theoretical with you because in online education, the community of inquiry framework is over 20 years old now as a very um, robust theory for teaching online, referring to these different forms of presence. And the one thing we know that's very important for good online instruction is teaching presence, having the teacher who's visible and who's responsive who's a real person. Another thing we've learned actually over the last nine months of COVID-19 is what's being described as emotional presence because learners and teachers have had a range of emotions that we need to take into account. But I try to keep things simple and not too theoretical for you. Um, so I'm just gonna make this as simple as I can and say in thinking about new technology and education, you really have to think about three kinds of interactions and how the technology can enhance those interactions. The first is the interaction between the teacher and the learner. We all know that, but technology can open up new ways of engaging between learners and teachers. Don't overlook the importance of technology helping learners interact with other learners, learner-learner interaction. Um, that's really important, creating a community of learners. And then thirdly, um, where a lot of online education puts its emphasis, as you will see in a slide shortly, is learner and the content interaction, the subject content. And too much focus on that without the other two interactions is not desirable at all. Um, and I have a powerful slide to try to capture that. I could make this a little bit more complicated because we now have new places for learning, we have new modes for learning, and even different paces for learning. Synchronous, as many of you are doing now, but some of your colleagues may watch this recording and we would call that asynchronous, not in real time. So it gets quite a lot more complicated, um, as we will see. And I don't expect many of you will be familiar with many of these learning theories, but we have lots of theories about how to learn online. This slide comes from uh, a website that's freely available called the Hotel Holistic Approach to Technology Enhanced Learning, where it identifies over 100 different learning theories. So where do you start? That's too complicated. Keeping it simple, stupid, we would say. That's known as the KISS principle. K-I-S-S, -S. keep it simple, stupid. So in the spirit of trying to keep it as simple as possible, we also have decisions that we have to make for designs 
as to whether our pedagogical compass, our teaching compass, is going to point towards learning by listening. That's what you're doing now. As I'm doing the talking, you're doing the listening, or I'm doing the teaching by telling, if you like. Or do you want your pedagogical compass, your teaching compass, to swing more towards learning by making, or learning by doing, or learning by sharing? Well, actually, good online, good digital education, your compass is going to point at some point, at some stage, in all four of those directions. It's not good pedagogy, good teaching for it to only point in one direction, as I'm doing now, teaching by telling. You do want your learners to share. You want them to make and do things. So um, the sad, unfortunate, unfortunate reality of most online education is what I describe here as the old pump, pump, dump model of online learning. This is pumping the information. Some might call it knowledge, but I'll just call it information into people's heads and no interaction other than that. And if there's one thing that you want to avoid in Iraq, it is a model of education for online ed learning that just produces content to learners. There's far more to it than this. Um, there are some very useful tools that you can use to support um, learning design. This is called the ABC Learning Design Framework, and you'll see the URL available there, or, uh, Google search or one form of search engine will find this. And what it tries to identify are the different types of learning experiences. So the focus here is not on the content, but on the learning experience. So yes, learning by acquisition does mean content, but there's learning with collaboration, there's learning with investigation, there's learning with discussion, and there's learning with production. So what it tries to do is help you design your online courses in ways that engage people in all of these things, not just learning by acquisition. And then um, mindful that you may not have access to some of the learning resources and tools that I have available, um, you may wish to have a look at this uh, publication that was uh, produced earlier in the year that identifies a whole raft of free web-based learning technologies. Um, my slides in the video will give you the access to the, the link if you're trying to get that now. Um, but so there are lots and lots of different tools that we can use. But you know, lots of those tools just make the decisions we have to make harder, not easier. And sometimes less is more. Too many tools makes it really hard to know which ones to choose. But there are lots of things that we typically don't use in online education, even in very developed countries like Ireland. And I'm almost at the end of this section. Uh, I wanted to also show how you could be very creative online. Um, and so this website takes you to lots and lots of suggestions for very clever and creative ways of designing online learning. You can see um, one of those, the conversation cafe. That's about trying to replicate what happens outside of class where learners get to talk about their learning um, as they would do on a campus-based experience. But there are other ways um, this website shows being very creative about rich learning experiences. And that word experience is really crucial. One very crucial part as well is often learners will do what they have to do in order to pass the course. So assessment can be very important in how the student will ultimately experience your design. So what we're trying to do at the moment in COVID-19 has helped us here in, the, in Ireland is rethink a lot of the traditional ways of assessment. And particularly what you're seeing on the slide here is the traditional examination. We don't really see that the examination is a good model of assessment to help us understand what people can really do. It's really a test of memory not a test of whether they can apply their knowledge in a real world situation. So 
online education, digital models of education are challenging us to rethink assessment. And that's a very important message I would also leave you with. This, this diagram here is one way of trying to capture whether in your context, your interest in digital or online education is where you're just trying to do small enhancements as depicted at one end of this continuum, if you like, that you're trying to substitute or augment, switch something from face to face to digital. Or in my own university, we're committed to trying to redefine a much deeper, as you can see in the diagram, a much deeper, the image, a much deeper approach to rethinking and transforming what we've been doing before. So do you really just want to bolt new technology onto what you've always been doing in a traditional way? Or do you really want to unbox things and be quite disruptive and do things very differently? Um, the answer to that question will be different depending upon your own situation, I think. But nonetheless, regardless of your situation, there is a very important message I need to convey. And that is, regardless of the technology, and I'm repeating myself to some degree from an earlier point, technology will not change minds. Um, people matter most. So transformative mindsets are really important, having the right will as well as the skill, being willing to embrace new ways of doing things. You're rebuilding your country, and I think it's a great opportunity for you to be doing things differently, not repeating past mistakes, shall we say. So I only have a few minutes left, I think, in time. I should fill uh, about five minutes probably, and then we'll stop for questions. It's hard for me to think how you might break out of the traditional box. So um, this part is a little Western centric or Irish centric in my examples here. But I want to reiterate that new digital technology should be a way of not reinforcing what some people still think is the gold standard of education. This image here, the traditional lecture. The traditional lecture has never been the best way of teaching. It's been one of the most common ways of teaching, but it isn't the gold standard. I fell asleep during lectures. We can do things so much better than going back to this. The lecture does have a place, and I'm lecturing you right now, just in a different form, but that is not what we want to reuse new digital technologies for. Also, it's predicted that between now and the year 2050, 2 billion more learners around the world will need to pursue education. And in terms of higher education, it's about 1 billion people around the world. And that's 1 billion people disproportionately in developing countries like your own. So what I can tell you is that old ways of education will not bring education to those 1 billion people that will need it, um, one additional billion. Even if we built, and I'm going to do a mathematical calculation with you, even if we built one new university every single day of the week between now and the year 2050, we wouldn't achieve enough capacity. So that would be seven universities every week. That would be 365 new universities every year around the world we'd have. That would be 10,950 universities additional that we would have over 30 years. All that would do is leave us with 330 or 329 million places for learners. So the reason for the, this calculation is to help you understand there will be people who say that traditional education is best. Maybe in some cases, yes, that is true, but irrespective, we will not be able to meet the demand for higher education through traditional models. So in the future, online education has to be part of the solution, not the only solution. Also, we have a challenge here that's often called the Iron Triangle. You see, in a country like your, your own, I imagine that you also are very focused on how you can provide education and open access, access being one part of the triangle, expand access 
but do that at a reasonable cost, not too expensive. What we know in the iron triangle is it's impossible to date to, to be able to do all three things, increase the quality of education, increase the access to education and reduce the cost. You can only increase the quality and increase the access if you actually increase the cost because it's going to cost you more. Or if you want to increase the access and reduce the cost of education, you're probably going to reduce the quality. So this is a really big challenge for us. And thinking about this is something that our governments and politicians and policymakers need to um, do more thinking about, even in well-developed countries. MOOCs, the free online courses that I've referred to, do have a role here because they are trying to give us new models, different approaches. They may not be quite the model yet, but they are making us see things differently. And during the COVID-19 crisis, the main MOOC platforms such as Coursera and edX and FutureLearn, and there are lots of others, had huge increases in the number of people learning online. I'm aware that there are Arabic speaking MOOC platforms, free platforms. I'm not fully aware of, shall we say, who's behind those initiatives. Um, this particular one, even some of the imagery that I saw when I was preparing my slides suggested to me it might be more of a US company that's developed this uh, because the imagery didn't look as appropriate as I would think. But nonetheless, I do think these sorts of platforms open lots of opportunities for the future to break down barriers and bring, uh, bring education to people who may not have the opportunity currently. The other thing about breaking out of the box, and I'm coming towards the end, just a couple of slides to go, is I don't think, and this is happening now in Ireland and all of Europe, that you need to do a full degree in order to somehow have the sorts of skills that you need for the 21st century. So what we're seeing happening right around the world, it's called unbundling. And so it works a little bit with the box metaphor. We're seeing the traditional degree being unbundled into smaller pieces, um, bite-sized parts, and we're calling these micro-credentials. And earlier today, a very important day for the European Commission, because we had a meeting where the, one of the major commissioners um, released the first working report for the future of micro-credentials across Europe. So what we're seeing is micro-credentials starting to emerge as credible qualifications, just like degrees, but in small parts. This will take some time, but I think this might be something that you would be wanting to explore, not full degrees for people, but smaller short courses. So my final lesson, I think I'm almost perfectly on time. My final lesson for you, I've given you a, a lot to think about, a lot of ideas, but even here in a developed country such as Ireland or New Zealand, where I'm originally from, to quote from one of the leading professors in digital education, using new digital technology to improve education is not rocket science, it's actually much, much harder than that. Um, and there's very few places that we could say are doing this really well. Um, hopefully you have the opportunity in Iraq um, to really make a difference, a transformative difference for your population. So I wanna end with just a couple of remarks and then we'll have a look and see what questions are in the um, question Q and A or the chat box. So my first remark is, I want to really challenge you to be future makers. You have to have the courage to be a future maker, to be willing to explore and think about new frontiers, new ways of doing things, to reimagine today's world for a better tomorrow. Because um, yesterday's solutions are still going to give us the outcomes we got in the past. So we have to be imaginative. And at a personal note, a quote of my own that I published some years ago, if it's not you that's going to do this, to help us make a better and more evenly distributed future, then who else will it be? So we all have an important role to play to make 
a better world through what new digital technologies um, make available to us. So thank you very much on that note. And I'm now going to stop sharing the screen and we'll um, see what's in the chat box and the Q&A um, section. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Brown, for uh, this uh, interesting and uh, informative uh, webinar. And uh, I'm sure the attendees, uh, they have got a lot from uh, your talk uh, and from your long experience. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Brown. So uh, I think now we, we will have uh, five minutes just for the registration. Uh, and then uh, after that, we will uh, take the Q&A uh, questions. So if you have any question, please write it down and then uh, you can post it in the uh, coming minutes. Uh, in the, uh, and, and post it. Do you want them to have the question in the chat box or through the Q&A, Professor Brown? Um, it's easier if you pose your question in the chat box, but uh, we will try to find it either in the chat box or okay. the Q&A. That's great. Thank you very much. So, dear all, I will send you now the uh, registration and certificate link, and you will have five minutes to complete your registration, and you will get the certificate.